Welcome to the Shatter After podcast. In this special edition of Creator Shatter, I, Brandon, have the amazing privilege to talk to the two executive producers that are behind the amazing Marvel's Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur, an amazing animated show that's premiered on Disney Plus and the Disney Channel, which the Disney Channel shaped so many lives. <laughs> uh, I'm from that generation where animation and Disney Channel was amazing. Um, uh, Steve Loader here uh, worked on Kim Possible, which again, huge fan. <laughs> um, awesome. And Rodney Clapton worked here on Futurama, which I find it hilarious how both of y'all shaped my life in different stages in life. <laughs> Very different shows. <laughs> Marvel, the studios and brand has become this pop culture machine that is constantly in the zeitgeist of the world with new projects announced and releasing consistently for the last 15 years. How did Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur arrive at your doorstep? Did y'all seek it out? Did someone seek you out? What, what was, what's the story behind that? Uh, it starts with Lawrence Fishburne loving comic books. Um, he's a big comic book fan, particularly from the 70s and 80s. And he read Devil Dinosaur. He read Moon Boy. Uh, and so when the opportunity came along, uh, he, he actually was in love with the comic already. He, he was familiar with it. So when he had a meeting with Marvel, it was just like it was just a natural fit to say, hey, I think that I wanted to do an animated series of this. So he took it to his producing partner, Helen Suglin at Cinema Gypsy, the amazing company that's made Blackish, Mixedish, Grownish. And so calls were made to Marvel, calls were made to Disney, and then now all of a sudden we have the very first collaboration between Disney TV animation and Marvel. That's and that's that's a huge undertaking too, which is amazing. Um, Rodney, how did you fit into the picture? Well, I, I came in uh, a little bit later after the development, and you know they were looking for uh, directors for the show, and Steve uh, got in contact with me and uh, just basically he showed me. The concept, the proof of concept, you know, there was the the Gambino clip that's been going around now. And that was the first thing he showed me, and he showed me the artwork, and then I was like, first I saw the artwork, and I was just like, oh, this is this is really nice. And then he showed me the Gambino clip. I was like, so this, like this music, is this what you're going for? I'm like, yeah, like, I'm really trying. He's like, he, and he was so passionate about it. And, and I felt it and I felt it, you know, was, and there was a, a, a black girl who was a super genius. And I, and I haven't seen that in animation and it was just a whole, a whole, everything I'm just coming at me. And I was just like, this is, this is going to be dope. I need to get on this. And. And I haven't worked with Steve since, uh, what was it 1990s, something or other? Oh, it was in the nines, somewhere in the yeah, nines. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We know each other from way, way, way back. Way, and so this is a comeback. Oh, yeah. yeah. This is a yeah. comeback story right here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Coming home thing. And it's funny because we, both awesome. went to, we also finally both went to the same high school in New York, too. But not at the same time. times, a couple of years yeah. apart. But yeah, yeah, it was pretty it was bizarre. I, I love the idea that both y'all come from New York and know what it is to live there. And one of the things that distinguishes New York, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. My mom was raised in Brooklyn. So I've been to the boroughs. I've been to New York. Like my, my mom would always talk to me about Sunnyside Court over there in Brooklyn. Uh, my grandfather lives in Jamaica State. So I, I, I've been around. I remember one of the greatest experiences of my life is I was allowed to go on a trip by my own, on my own, to visit my grandfather, I spent a whole summer in New York and I made it my job to learn the streets and just, I was able to travel the subway by myself. It's an experience, it's the world and it's so enriching. And based on your experience and what you guys just shared, I think I'm gonna skip to this question because it's so true to what I see in every single panel and every single animation and the music in the feel of how you've built, how you're able to represent the community of the, of the Lower East Side. And the cast is diverse. And it's very true to real life. Like I didn't even have, I was funny. I was talking to my co-host Mike and I was like, I didn't even notice the diversity because to me, that's New York. It felt real. It felt organic. Um, we've seen thousands of stories set in New York city, but still feature a predominantly white cast. 
How important was it to you to capture the different culture and accurately represent the New York experience for you guys? Yeah, I mean, it was super important, you know, but also like, like you said, we wanted it to just feel like organic because that is New York, that it's organic, you know, that it's different, diverse, different communities. They all live together, you know, they all take the train, you know, everyone takes the okay. train. So we wanted to represent that as authentically as we as we can and 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 truthfully and you know it goes not just in front of the camera so to speak it also is behind the scenes too because we deal with we have a crew that's very diverse and has different point of views and and stories and we can integrate that into what we what we put on the screen and what we put in the scripts so it's very important just to represent New York and, and diversity in, in the most authentic and, and natural way. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I think it was really fortunate for Rodney and I to have gone to the High School of Art and Design because it was a it was a public school, but it was art forward school. So what it meant is you had students coming from all different boroughs. So you have Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan, and they all brought a different art interest and sensibility. This person wanted to be a cartoonist. This person wanted to be a fashion designer. This person wanted to be a graffiti artist. So I think that it was it was good that we were all kind of thrown together with the passion of art, but it was just, it was a whole, whole lot of different people, different places that we just kind of riffed off each other and basically just became great artists kind of based on all of this exposure to different people and different art. Yeah, it's basically, yeah, because New York for me was a, a really enriching experience in terms of just seeing other cultures and, and learning other things from other cultures and just, even if it's not in the school, but it's just being around it and seeing it in the streets and, and, and being immersed in that. So, yeah. Yeah, and that's the beauty of New York too. Like you can walk one corner and it feels like something. You walk, as soon as you turn the corner, it's something else. Yeah. It's a different world entirely. And and that idea of art school also is because I, I was I studied music at a conservatory, which Ooh. is another different sign, but it's like all these different people from all over the world just talking the same language, but differently at the same time. But it's so much easier and organic with music. I can imagine the experience is probably similar with you because, oh, wait, I, I, I can express that the same way. But the way you express it, it's so you. I can't even touch it. But then you still marvel and admire it, right? Yeah. Because it's just the way of that person expressing themselves. Absolutely. And this takes me into the animation. Um, I'm going to jump into this one because to me, if I don't, if I don't ask this, um, my co-host would be angry with me, but I wouldn't forgive myself because of our love of anime. Whose idea was it to have that episode one Easter egg with Naruto Team 7 on there? And how, how big was anime as an influence to the animators? <laughs> okay, I'm going to guess, yeah, I, I, I think it was probably Ben Juano, our, our supervising uh, director and co-producer um, that may have done that. It might have been Christine Liu, the, one of our directors. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, here's the thing. That's why it's 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 hard to, to figure out because everyone on the crew is huge fans of anime. Yeah, so it's awesome. anybody. Um, that is awesome. Yeah, yeah, there was. I mean, and it's interesting because um, there's there's you're, you're passionate about a particular anime. For instance, I know Ben Juano is passionate about One Piece. I'm passionate about Cowboy Bebop. Um, so we, we, we have, we're bringing a lot to the table. Yeah. It's an art style that pops, right? That, that just says a lot just by being present, as opposed to just depending on dialogue and stuff like that. A lot of the visuals make what the story's doing. And I love how you guys mix and match different types of animation because this, this because moon girl and devil dinosaur is not just one thing yeah right um i gotta say there's i see a little bit of spider verse in terms of the language but it's not a copy it's its own version of it like the way you dig into the comic book roots the construction of panels uh sound effects and stuff like that i dig the neon in boss fights it is so metal in video games um so how was the process of cracking the code for what this show was going to look like. Yeah, that that was a uh, you know Sean Jimenez. He was uh, there initially and earlier on to just uh, doing the concept art of it and really creating, working on the look because you know what we really were trying to figure out was like how best to portray New York. You know, New York itself is a character. This is also yeah. a comic book show, so we wanted to have that integrate that also. 
So, you know, we drew a lot of inspiration, like what is New York? It's gritty. It's got texture. It's, you know, we have the artists you're thinking of Basquiat, you think of Warhol, Keith Haring, graffiti. And then also, you know, you're drawing a little inspiration from the UPA, Saul Bass, you know, really like abstract uh, look of things. And then the pen and ink style with the characters, you know, and really getting leaning into that that uh, comic book graphicness of everything right. and, and, and making and how that works together and not competing. So you have like a little bit of also the old school look of the backgrounds, which is like the texture and the half tones and the offset printing of things. And we really just wanted to uh, do something that that stood out and really represented New York and looked well, really good because, yeah, Spider-Verse definitely was an inspiration in that we saw that, OK, we can do something and push the medium, especially for TV animation and kids, yes. kids shows and really push it and, and 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 take it to another place. So it allowed us to, like, open up our our coffer, let's say, and, and, and just really push them and push it in, in, in visually and sonically and, you know, with the music and everything, you know, we didn't really want to, to talk down to the audience and, and, and in terms of what the show represents, you know, it's a family and community. And also with the scripts, we really wanted to, to tackle issues and also do it in a way that is not like on a very special episode or a weekend special kind of thing, but yes. handling it, in a creative way, which is also entertaining, but also will also spark conversation. So each person that's watching it, you don't have to be like six year old, but like you can be six to 90 watching the show. Everybody's going to get something from it. And at some point there will be maybe a conversation that is sparked from, from that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that we went into this with very uh, cinematic sensibilities. Uh, it was super fortunate. I had been in TV for a long time. Then I was in features for a little while and came back to TV and kind of brought a lot of the sensibilities from feature to TV. And one of them is the depth of storytelling. When you're working on something in TV, you're thinking episodically, you're thinking about, okay, how do we kind of keep this character arc going over X amount of episodes? But I think that with this show, it was a different notion. It was the idea that, okay, we wanted to have, we wanted to tell deeper stories deeper arcs. And like initially when we were developing Lunella and the family, we could present an hour's worth of material of this is what the character wants, is what the character needs. This is his personality. This is her personality because we had done a lot of the homework. And I think because of that, you've created something that is four quadrant, which is an industry term, which basically means that you can watch it with the whole family. So, so the, the parents are enjoying it as much as the kids. And I think that was a really important thing for us. Yeah. And, and, and I haven't worked on a show like this because as Steve mentioned, there's a whole cinematic treatment of everything and yeah. visually and the script. And, um, you know, we do things like color scripts and I remember seeing those in more feature things where you, you're basically mapping out all the shots, but you, you're, you're, you're doing color and seeing the tones of each and, and mood of each scene. And, and then also we're getting things where from the animation studio, Flying Bark, we get dailies, which are, you know, animation yeah. dailies, which I never even heard of, you know? And in fact, I was looking at some this morning and we get it every week and I sit with the art director, um, Jose and, and our animation lead, or, um, Kat Kazmala. And we just look at the shots and we, we see what's working and what, what isn't working. And we just make notes and call retakes on that. And, but it's just like a treat that every week you get that email with a package of, of scenes. Like, oh, what are they going to, what are they, <laughs> yeah. gonna, how are they going to marvel us today with their, cause it's an amazing studio. And, and just the process of how it, this works is very different than you would think from a, an animation, a TV animated show. It's like making a movie, but much, much faster. Yes, much, much faster. <laughs> yes. Yeah, definitely, definitely faster pace. <laughs> I, I really love, um, because everything you guys are saying, as someone that's seen the show, I've seen it. Like, the idea that the debut, right, the premiere show, was already aired, right? Mm -hmm. Deal with blackouts, which is something that is consistently troubling in any part of Manhattan, mm -hmm. and how it directly impacts stores businesses, families, and the idea that you were able to communicate that in such a simple 
wording and in a very organic way that I can be sitting with my nephew and he will understand mm -hmm. and he would get it and he would get why Lunella wants to solve this, you know, and, and I love how, how simple it is, but also how complex it is, but also how real it is because these are things that actually happen and still happen. Um, and if in the Heights can do a whole scene about a blackout, mm -hmm. there's no reason why you couldn't s explain this to a kid that would understand and have fun with it. Um, so kudos, great job on that. And I, and I love it. I can't wait to keep watching. Um, now we have to talk about our, what I see as the two main leads. I mean, diamond, diamond white is amazing as Lunella Lafayette. And Lee Barr is brilliant as Casey. How was the audition process to find your lead and her powerful Latina social media manager? How was that adventure? It was fairly easy. Uh, and I know maybe other shows will be jealous about this, of how easy it was for us. <laughs> but um, actually, Moon Girl was developed um, twice. And so I was the kind of the second incarnation of that development process. And Diamond White had auditioned and gotten the role for the first incarnation of it. So, so when I kind of took over the show, it was like, all right, you know, you want to kind of reset and kind of listen to all the auditions, hundreds of auditions again. And I was like, all right, I, I guess I will. And the first one I listened to was Diamond because she was, she was initially hired. I didn't listen to anything after that. It was like, that's it. She's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, so Diamond was 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 super super easy to to see what a perfect Lunella Lafayette she was from day one, and Lee Bay Barrer was was incredible too. She came in and she was recommended to me, and I had seen her on uh, Amazon series Sneaky Pete, and she was great on that. And she came in, and we just kind of pitched the character, and she's like, "I think I know this character," and she went into the booth, got it done, and she was great. She was she was she was in instantly. So yeah, it's so. It was really easy. I think that I think it was a testament to our writers in a lot of ways because they had done so much homework on the characters and really figuring out who they are. So when the actor came in and they had a script, it was so deep that they would go, oh, okay, I, I know everything I need to know about this character. I can figure out their backstory and how they'd react in any given situation. And they just kind of hit it, hit the ground running and a testament to their talent that they're able to extrapolate that from the script and then create a whole voice personality for it yeah it, it, it was phenomenal i mean i to me it was hilarious and what a great combination and see how their relationship continues to grow it's so great yeah, i can't it, wait to keep it watching was definitely them. you know an experience also watching them record together and one was in new york and then one was in la and we're doing it over zoom and it's it's for me that was a whole different experience too but it's also great to have these two characters because they are kind of, you see them at the beginning that, you know, they're kind of outsiders in a way, they're right. lonely and, and, you know, and, and, you know, Lunella in her way and Casey in her way, and then they find each other and they're kind of opposites, but then they also work. And it's something about seeing a real female friendship and portraying that as, as uh, accurately and, and as organically as we can. And, and showing the positives of that, we really wanted to lean into that and, and highlight that as a, an aspect too for the show. And they're good friends in real life now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I am not know. surprised. Yeah. Um, is 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 Barrera, uh, Diamond's social manager? Is that <laughs> I no Diamond does an awesome job being her own social media manager. I gotta say, she's she's incredible. That's awesome. I, I love, to me, that speaks to me as, as someone that grew with Disney Channel TV um, and loves anime and talks about it all the time. That's very anime. That's one of the quirks of anime that we talk a lot about in Amateur Otaku is that there, you have these outsider characters that are, are very unique because they love something dearly that nobody else gets. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what Lunella and, and Casey are. She's this 13 social media genius and she's a science genius mm -hmm. so everybody looks at them as these weird pockets of the different universes right. but they work so well together which is why they're so great characters to pair yeah, up yeah absolutely yeah they're they're beautiful. like like ron said they're both outsiders this is their first friendship together yep. so yeah yep. it's, it's it's yeah so um one of the last questions that i have because again you guys mentioned it from the beginning of the interview and i have to bring it up now how did you guys 
land on Raphael's CD because the, this soundtrack. This is, guy tell it because he's okay, fire. Okay, a this, guy, this, this is fire. <laughs> There's a story. Okay, so so I've been a massive fan of Raphael Sadiq's for a very long time. I'm a huge music nerd, so I, I feel like I have good music taste and I gravitate towards artists that are really great. And Raphael Sadiq is absolutely the top of that list. I mean, Tony, Tony, Tony. All his producing work. He's been nominated for Academy Awards. His solo albums. Everything is absolutely incredible. Just won and a Grammy. So, sorry, what? Just won a Grammy. Just won a Grammy, right? We call it Beyonce song, Beautiful. right? Okay, so, so it was at the point where you know I said to Disney Music, I said, "Oh, I really love to get this guy." And it's like, "Wow, he's a touring musician. He's producing John Legend. He's, he's doing all this. Stuff. I don't know if it, his schedule we fit into that." And so I kind of realized, all right, well, I got to kind of got to seek this out my own, my own. So he was doing a record signing uh, at a record store in LA. So I made sure I was first in line. I had my record. And so he, as he was signing my record in the 30 seconds, it was taking to sign my record. I pitched in the show. And by the time that autograph was done, he signed on to the show. He said, no. he's going to do this. And he said, my manager's right over there. Talk to them and let's get this set up. And I got to tell you, it's been an amazing relationship ever since. He is, I mean, people probably overuse the word genius a lot, but in, in his case, it is absolutely appropriate because we can throw any musical style, any notion his way, and he'll just come up with something that is completely brand new and unheard of. The main title, usually when you do a main title of any given show, you do a hundred demos. You 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 go out to a hundred different people because those are all kind of filters and everything, you know. Stuff. Yeah, it's, it's a super important part of any given, certainly animated TV show. And so Raphael Sadiq hit Moon Girl Magic on the first try. On the first try, that was the only demo we ever received. That was the only one we ever needed, and he hit it right out of the park, first time. So that is it's unheard of. That's how amazing he is. I can tell you how amazing he is. Um, my mom doesn't watch anything that I do. <laughs> and she watched the show and she's been sending me articles about the show and, and, and things that, you know, interviews and things. And uh, she's like, I can't get that song out of my head. <laughs> so Little girl magic, baby. Yeah. So, you know, that's a testament. If so anyone good. Testimony right there. Yep. the genius of it in our rock. Yeah, and the and the and how easy he's able to capture the the essence of the show because everything feels organic. It feels like it belongs together. Like there's no way that this will go with anything else. It goes with this. And it has this childlike and also African American qualities that you look for for this environment for the type of animation. So yeah, that was the the, the soundtrack just blew me away and how it helped me kept engaged. And also of course I used to streaming now, even on the little um, commercial slots, when you have just the title card in between commercials, like the little groove is just so good. Yeah. I mean, it's, that's the other yeah. thing is I think that a, a lot of times we're talking about the songs, which of course are absolutely brilliant. But I think we somewhat overlook the score because he's also doing the score. And it's also incredible because when you think of score, sometimes you feel like, okay, you're, you're keying to a beat or a moment and stuff like that. But Raphael create, creates like these beds, these these groove beds for the characters. And it's just it's it's just it's keying into the emotion, but it's not you. So you can listen to it on its own. It's got a groove yes. to it, and it's just incredible. Yeah, even the score is amazing. It's, it's the tone and the vibe and uh, what yes the mission yes. statement that we want to create with the style of the show. So you know, it's it's definitely sophisticated and that's what we wanted to have a little sophistication bring that up for kids uh programming and uh yeah you know we when we got Raphael, we really scored really scored big on that no it, it was awesome it was awesome i only got one more question and this is the inner nerd in me and it's the obligatory question that i have to ask because moon girl takes place in new york so as we know congrats on renewal on season two already thank you um <laughs> Season one is still releasing on a weekly basis on Disney Channel and Disney Plus. What can we expect from the next couple of episodes? And will any of our New York based heroes, wink, wink, meet our Moon Girl? You want to take the first part of that question, Ronnie? I'll take the second part. 
Um, well, as, as Steve uh, adeptly said in the San Diego Comic-Con last year, it was like, we are Marvel compliment, MCU complementary. So we're not necessarily in the cinematic universe, but we are complementary. So there are possible uh, elements of, of uh, characters coming in and out of the LES. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, so I, I think as far as as Marvel Easter eggs are concerned, like keep keep an eye out. There's a lot of interesting stuff coming up, and I think that um, one thing that's also been great about working with Marvel, who's been amazing partners, is you know Ron and I are comic book fans as well, and so we've been able to put a lot of deep cut characters in the show. Um, that haven't been in any form of, of Marvel media, actually. So, so yeah, be, you'll be, you're going to be surprised at, at who turns up. Yeah. But what's coming up in the show is, I mean, as you've seen in the first episode now, Unella has become Moon Girl with her partner, Devil Dinosaur. Uh, and she's just getting used to being a superhero. And I think life is going to get kind of complicated for her. Because, yes, she protects the Lower East Side, but now people are aware of her. Not just, you know, adoring fans, but maybe some also some villains around town, too. So her life is going to get really complicated in the next uh, next kind of bunch of episodes. But there's a lot of fun to be had, a lot of comedy, a lot of great music. Uh, yeah, you're in for a real adventure. Yeah. I can't wait to watch more. Steve Loader, Ronnie Clowden. You guys are amazing. Thank you for your time and talking with me about Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur. Um, if people wanted to find you in the interwebs, wanted to know what you guys are up to, where can they find you? Uh, I'm on uh, Twitter and Instagram. Uh, the handle is uh, at Steve Loader. So, yeah. <laughs> and I'm just on Instagram with uh, Gogo Rodzilla. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Very nice. You guys are awesome. If you guys love interviews like this, stay tuned to the Shatter After where we talk with creators all the time on Creator Shatter. This has been Creator Shatter with Steve Loader and Ronnie Cloud for Moo Girl and Double Dinosaur. Have it awesome, guys. Peace. Thank, Thank you. you.